Confederates, their position is, oh, should we use the words concave and convex? No, let's, that's too bad. Let's, too bad. <laughs> Let's too get into math class. Yeah. People are saying, hey, this is a history podcast, <laughs> not math. But um, it's very hard for the Confederacy to reinforce one side or the other. They'd have to travel great distances. But despite the fact that the Union has this terrific configuration, one Union Corps commander, one guy on the left, he decides he he has better ideas. He, he knows a better way to do things, which is always dangerous. Without orders. He moves his corps off Seminary Ridge, moves it forward. He, th he thinks it's a better position. So he creates a huge gap in the Union line. It's Sometimes you call it a salient or a bulge. So you've got this nice, tight Union line, but whoop, one piece is missing. It's been pulled out front. Uh, so he moves it closer to the Confederate portion. He thinks he can use his artillery better. But as I mentioned, this creates a bulge and gaps in the Union line. Meade, the commanding general, overall General Meade, had to send units to plug the gaps, and this week in the Union Center and right. All right, A.P. Hill is sent towards the center, not to do a full attack, but just to keep them busy so that they can't reinforce uh, the, the right and the left. Longstreet is assigned the job of attacking the Union left, but Longstreet, as we've seen, he doesn't really believe in this. He, he understands what's going to happen. He understands how good the ground is that the Union Army is on. And so he just isn't real fired up about it, and I don't know that he pushes it as best as he could. There's a, several reasons, but suffice it to say that he doesn't even launch the attack until 4 p.m., 4 p.m. So it's this is July. It's going to be dark in a few hours. His forces encounter stiff opposition in Devil's Den, Devil's Den is a heavily wooded and rocky area where Sickles' forces are. He doesn't expect Sickles to be there because Sickles is out of position. And there's also a wheat field and a peach orchard. So there's all kinds of obstacles. Uh, Sickles himself is injured in the fighting. He loses a leg. And he has an interesting backstory. I can't resist mentioning this, that one time he had caught his wife in bed with another man. And he went out and shot the man later. <laughs> And he was put on trial and was actually acquitted. So, this is a fighter. <laughs> that sounds like that sounds like Tuesday morning for Andrew Jackson. So it was the time. Yeah, it's, yeah. You know, for Jackson, that's just uh, it's just what you do. It's just a another day's work, right? <laughs> <laughs> but Sickles, yeah, he's kind of Jacksonian in that way, and not a man to be uh, messed around with. But as an army commander or a corps commander, he's he's not doing his job here clearly, and he loses a leg uh, in the process. But Longstreet gets around to the Union far left, and he sends troops up the hill called Little Round Top. It's just south of Seminary Ridge, which is in the middle. And at first, the hill was undefended, but the last minute, a Union Corps is rushed to the top, and they push back repeated rebel assaults. And this is uh, one of the best parts of the movie Gettysburg. And I'm sorry if y'all are tired of me talking about movies, but that's just tough because it's such a great movie, and I love it so much. I went to see it in the theater, you know. Twice a four hour movie. That's how insane did they have I am. an intermission. Uh, I think they did. Yeah. It, it was, I mean, this is like 1993, so I, it's, I don't remember. It's been 25 years, but anyway, I want to tell the great story of the 20th Maine. The 20th Maine regiment was commanded by a former college professor named Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. So you remember, Scott, when we were saying earlier that you could actually become a colonel by raising your own regiment, and you said, oh, that would be a terrible regiment, but not necessarily, because this man had no military experience. He'd never been to West Point. He, he taught philosophy and languages and religion and things like that, So, but he turned out to be a really good commander. He just had a knack for military stuff, and what happens is these Confederates are charging up the hill, and he's on the far left. It's very interesting, and there's a scene in the movie where one of his commanders comes up to him and he says, look to your left, gentlemen, and they look. And he, he says, you will see that there's no one there. You are the extreme left of the Union line. You must not give way. You must hold this position at all costs. And so they do. They're getting – a lot of people are dying and getting hurt. The Confederates charge, and they drive them back, and the Confederates charge up the hill again, and they drive them back, and it looks like the next – assault by the Confederates is going to break the line. The 20th Maine is running out of ammunition. In fact, they do run out of ammunition. And so Chamberlain says, all right, fix bayonets. 
So they put their bayonets on the end of their rifle bullets, and he does them swing around. He has them swing around, and they charge down the hill with their bayonets. So that's kind of like the rebel charge in reverse. They're not doing the rebel yell, but, <laughs> but they, they charge down the hill, and the Confederates are shocked. They, they're not expecting this. They, they didn't expect all these screaming bluecoats to be coming down the hill at them, and so a lot of them end up surrendering. And so Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, the former college professor, becomes the hero of day two of Gettysburg, at least for the Union, that is, <laughs> not for the Confederates. They, they capture as prisoners 400 Confederates, and they save the Union left. They keep it from buckling. So that's a great story. And again, I, everybody definitely want to read the book and watch the movie. Um, at one point, the Union Center develops a mile-long gap. That's a pretty darn long gap, a mile long. The rebels threaten to cut it in two, but Meade plugs the hole at the last minute. And it, we've seen a lot of last-minute heroics, haven't we, in, in these battles. At dusk, Ewell attacks the Union right. He almost takes Cemetery Hill and Culp's Hill, but he narrowly fails. And that evening, uh, so this, this basically, we've in summary, there were a lot of Confederate attacks, a lot of bloody fighting and the confederates come so close they come so close in so many parts of the union line but they just don't quite break through they don't quite push the union back and uh, and that's especially amazing when you consider the good ground that the union troops were on longstreet again goes to robert e lee and he says can we please redeploy can we please move around and get behind the Union uh, soldiers, and, and Lee says, no, I'm not. The, once again, the enemy is there. I will attack him there. Hey, everyone. Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. Well, first of all, I'm really inspired as a university humanities instructor. So I guess both James, you and I... Um, if there are any uh, military recruiters out there, I, I just hearing the story, I think both of us could be effective commanders if you just drop us in Afghanistan, Absolutely. Afghanistan we'll, or wherever troops are stationed now. We'll hit the books. We're quick studies. We promise. Yeah, it's. I mean, I think I could handle um, helicopter corps, whatever. It'd be easy. <laughs> yeah. So no problem. Modern modern warfare is, I think, a slightly more complicated. <laughs> Not that this was easy, but a couple more know. moving parts, one could say. But um, what did I know? I didn't go to West Point like all these guys, so I am not qualified. But yeah, just taking a step back uh, now that we've wrapped up the second day. Now, like you said, it came within an inch of the Confederacy breaking the line. So it's very easy to imagine counterfactuals where they were successful. And there are many innumerable factors that we just don't perhaps don't even know about that could have uh, caused it not to happen. So on the one hand, I don't want to read too much into Confederate defeat. But on the other hand, they did lose and we read into things. This is what we do. So some of the criticisms, I mean, as you already said, there's Lee ordering a frontal attack against the objections of division commanders. But another criticism I've seen of Lee is that he didn't properly support them when they did launch their attack. So Lee stands by why Hill's uh, third corps in the center of the Confederate line. And he does little to assist Longstreet. So he's not going after the right point in the line. He's not supporting uh, the attack effectively enough. So there's another opportunity that he missed. And I don't know if this is his last one to really uh, turn the battle. Yesterday would have been an even bigger chance that he missed uh, when the uh, forces weren't as outmatched as they are now. But, okay, day three. Now, this is the thing. This is the meat of the Battle of Gettysburg. This is the... Bet that if anyone knows anything about it, it's this. So let's jump into it. So July 3rd, day three of Gettysburg. What's happening? All righty. Day three, Lee orders another attack on Culp's Hill. Again, this is on the uh, Union right, the Confederate left. And both of the lines are running roughly north to south. Uh, the attack on Culp's Hill once again fails. This is the third day in a row that the Confederates failed to take that hill. And General Stewart was supposed to get behind the Federals and attack them by the rear. He had returned by this point. There's a very great scene in the movie where Lee has to basically uh, fuss at Stewart. He has to let him know that he, he's let him down, and Stewart offers to resign. And, of course, Lee says no. Um, but Stewart is now put into action. He, he's trying to get behind the Federals and attack them. But he stopped. Again, here we see Federal Cavalry rising to the challenge. And the Federal Cavalry that stopped Stuart were led in part 
He wasn't the senior commander, but he was there by a 23-year-old general named George Armstrong Custer, who will have a big future, <laughs> as everybody knows. So many cameos in the Civil War. I know. I, I can't resist name dropping from time to time. We've, we've seen people like James Garfield and George Custer. who They're going to come along and have even more bigger roles to play in the future. But anyway, so by late morning on the 3rd, Lee felt that the Union Center would be weakened because he believed that they had sent many troops to the right and the left. If you remember, Lee had ordered savage attacks. The Confederates had fought very, very hard on the Union right and left. And Lee just assumed that because he had, they'd fought so hard there and, and inflicted so many casualties that the Union Center would have had to have sent people to reinforce, and then therefore the Union Center is going to be weak. It's a reasonable assumption. Um, he orders three divisions, 13,000 men, uh, under the command of George Pickett, Isaac Trimble, and Johnson Pettigrew to march about a mile up a gentle slope and attack the Union soldiers on Cemetery Ridge, who I remind you are dug in. They're behind earthworks. This is the probably one of the most infamous things that happened in the Civil War. It's been one of the most questioned and argued decisions that any commander made in the Civil War. Actually, Longstreet is in command of this. Uh, one of my professors in uh, well, my undergraduate professor that I took Civil War under, he said it really should be called Longstreet's Assault, not Pickett's Charge, because Pickett was just one of three commanders. But for whatever reason, Pickett's uh, division, it was the main one. And so he gets the <laughs> he gets to go through all Poor time. Guy. Yeah, I know. Pickett's Charge. Um, Meade saw it coming. He knew this was going to happen. Uh, Meade was not surprised and he was ready. The Confederates begin with an artillery barrage of the hill, so they're firing every cannon. They're hitting them with everything they have. Union artillery responded, and then all of a sudden, the Union artillery stops. And by the way, this is the largest artillery barrage ever to occur in the Western Hemisphere. It was heard as far away as Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, which is 40 miles away. Okay, so again, the Union guns fall silent, and so Lee just assumes the Union artillery had been disabled. Makes sense, right? Why would they stop firing? They know we're coming, but they stopped. Ergo, they must have uh, had all, most, or if not all their cannon damaged or destroyed or something. So Pickett goes to Longstreet, who again, Longstreet's really in command. Pickett says, what is your order? Give me the order, sir. Longstreet knows what's going to happen. He knows this is going to be a disaster doesn't want any part of it. And he couldn't even bear to give the order. He just nodded. He just kind of waved his hand and nodded. And so Pickett's all excited. Pickett is, Pickett's troops are fresh. We, we talked about earlier that they had been away and they had just joined the Army. They were the last Confederate division to fall into line. So off they march. And as soon as they start marching, and this is just a – imagine a, and this is the scene that – of this in the movie is like 20 minutes long. It's, it's really, really long. It's epic. It's one of the best battle scenes I've ever seen. Anyway, they've got this long, long line slowly marching up this gentle slope, wide open, just perfect killing field really. And they're going and they're going. Uh, and all of a sudden, surprise, surprise, the union artillery opens up again. So, so much for the theory that the union artillery was messed up. <laughs> It's perfectly fine. Thank you very much. The Union uh, uh, commander had actually said, hey, just be quiet for a while. Stop. He, he tricked them into thinking maybe uh, they were damaged, so, but they weren't. And so this artillery barrage rips through the attacking Confederate army. They decimate the Confederate line, and about half of the Confederates are either killed or wounded. The attackers by the way, were forbidden to fire until they were right up on the Union lines. You didn't want them stopping and firing. You wanted them to get across that open field as fast as possible so they could get to the top of the hill, or the ridge, rather. It's not, not really a hill. Um, by the end of the charge, only a few Confederates reached the Union position, but all of them were either killed or captured. The Confederates retreated to where they started, but only about half make it back. And I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I, I remember from reading the Killer Angels and some other things that I think seven generals were killed 
or wounded in this attack and 13 colonels, almost every single colonel. The colonel is the commander of a regiment, which is supposed to have a thousand people.